it's the the last uh, communication, the last talk of the, today's uh, conference. Um, I'm I'm here to present you and to to welcome uh, Catherine Oud. Uh, she's our first keynote speaker. Uh, most of, of you perhaps already know uh, her work. She's a uh, performance senior curator at Tate Modern, uh, where she's uh, develop developing uh, um, a strong and continuous work about uh, performing in the in the performance in, inside of the, the museological uh, space. Um, the first time I contacted Catherine Wood was in the context of a publication that was uh, organized by Anna Peich that you already had a chance to listen today, uh, performance in the public sphere. There is uh, two versions. There is a, a printed version in Portuguese, uh, performance uh, na esfera pública and also the English uh, version uh, uh, version that you can find uh, uh, online. So uh, there it's uh, an extensive uh, uh, book where you can find lots of very uh, important texts on performance. And uh, one, uh, I think it's, it's uh, a contribution where you can find an interview by Catherine Wood. So I, uh, uh, I recommend you to, to look for it. Um, Kat Catherine uh, is, uh, was the curator of the installation that is now in uh, Tate Turbine Hall uh, of Tanya's Burgera uh, work. Uh, she will speak more about it in a few uh, minutes. She was um, curator also in 2070 of Robert Rauschenberg's ret retrospective and co-curator uh, in 2070, 17 and 2018 of the live exhibition in the Tanks and Well program. Uh, I think we can ask after during the discussion what it is this uh, Tanks and Well program and the role that uh, it fulfills inside the, a museum as state. Um, Catherine Wood also writes uh, for several publications, after all, Art Forum, Moose, and other uh, contemporary art publications. And uh, uh, for me, there was a book that was uh, particularly important, that was uh, the book Yvonne Reiner, The Mind is a Muscle, a muscle um, that was published in 2007. Well, I will just uh, welcome Catherine Wood and I will give you the, the stage. Please welcome. Hello. Thanks, Liliana, for the very nice uh, introduction and for inviting me and for the collaboration over all these years. That publication that you did is fantastic and I was very happy to be featured in it. And good to be here. Um, thanks very much to Culture Jest for hosting this and having me here. I've got so many thoughts after the other talks that I've seen this afternoon, um, but the, maybe the, the best segue, actually, for me, is the question of authenticity that came up just now, um, especially where it comes to Marina Abramovich. And for one thing, it just made me think, I mean, I'm going to go on to talk in two ways, actually, about question of love, although I agree with the person who asked that question earlier in terms of how how do we define it, how are we defining it, because I think I'm not at all explicitly trying to define it, but I'm going on, dare I say, some kind of instinct about an energy or a force or some kind of emotional drive that's linking the kinds of work that I'm going to talk about. And on the one hand, about what performance is and can be and does to the museum when you bring performance into the art museum. On the other hand, more specifically about Tanya Bruguera's practice and this recent project, her Turbine Hall Commission. But I thought, as we were talking about authenticity earlier, maybe we were forgetting in all the talk about love and all our desire for true love, um, that affect is also in the title. And my feeling about that Marina Abramovich Ule moment really gets to the heart of how brilliant, particularly Mar Marina Abramovich, is at producing an effect of authenticity through affect. And Tanya Bruguera is good at that too, but in a much more knowing way. And I think, you know, it's true, um, as 
as Bruno and I were just talking about outside out in the gap, it's true that there was this proliferation of apparently authentic body art in the kind of 1960s, 1970s period. Um, and perhaps as per the discussion around Ketty LaRocca, that was, had a naivety to it. But I think there's a marker which carries through into what I'll say about Tanya Bruguera's work of a belief in actually um, the fallibility of the body and pain as maybe an authentic marker more than the capacity for love, dare I say. Um, and this question of, of pain and vulnerability, which is connected to love, obviously, but carries through in many ways. So, so what I'm going to try to do is talking in two ways, really. Um, one, as I said, about what performance does to art and specifically what performance and trying to show performance and trying to collect performance, a practice based in the body and based in um, the energy and the kind of unruly nature of the human body in its formative period, in that kind of high period of body art that I've alluded to, what that does to the space of art and particularly as a curator in a large public museum, what does it do to the museum? And then, slight, you know, sort of intersecting with that, how has Tanya Bruguera's Turbine Hall Commission that's on view now come from a beginning that's located in body art practice as her work did uh, 20 years ago? That's where she began as an artist. And how has she as an individual carried the sensibility and the questions at stake in that practice through to a new, I'd, I'd say a renewed form of institutional critique that comes from this position of intimacy and vulnerability in her own body and how she applied that to the question of working with others and working with an institution. I've started with a picture of the, the turbine hall, which is where the action happens in, in many of these projects I'm talking about, partly as well because um, you know, in the spirit of intimacy and, and uh, the personal as political. I want to talk a little bit about my own journey as a curator too. And I remember distinctly coming to Tate Modern the first time it was open and looking at the turbine hall space and wondering why on earth the museum had put this dark, empty void in the heart of this new public building. Because at that point, it was sort of not quite filled by a Louise Bourgeois sculpture. And it felt like this giant space in which action was elsewhere. And what's been very interesting in museum terms is to see how people, the public, and also artist vision, and especially often through interaction or performance, have organically found ways to articulate the meaning of that space so that it's not empty and to fill it, but actually in ways that were not necessarily predicted by the architects or the the curators, you know, directors of the museum. So leaving that space of possibility seems to have been important. But in terms of my, my own journey as a curator, I want to um, look back to my first job, which was as a curatorial assistant in the British Museum, which you may know, I mean, as the, the London equivalent to the Metropolitan Museum in New York. <laughs> And I didn't, know what, I didn't know what being a curator was. I'd studied art history, and this was my first job, um, kind of running errands in this giant cavernous museum, pre-email, big bunches of keys and memos. And uh, one of the things I had to do there, in between running you know, down the dark corridors with the Egyptian funerary sculpture and Assyrian stone tablets and Mesopotamian artifacts, um, which were behind glass, but nevertheless still felt quite powerful, especially in the shadows. I had to do a course on object handling. And um, there's an image of it. Well, that was the, the image of it as it was conceived, the 18th century Enlightenment model, and now... But I found this image, actually, from the object handling course that you have to do as a curatorial assistant. And this, this is part of the kind of imprint of the museum that stays with me as a contemporary art curator, actually, the blueprint of the ideology of 
the Western art, well, the, the Western Museum on which any contemporary art museum like Tate is still fundamentally founded. And the entire choreography of behavior, of human behavior, the infrastructure of a museum like the British Museum, and this course I had to do, led by the conservators, was an afternoon spent in a dusty basement with kind of shafts of sunlight occasionally coming through the, you know, the wooden drawers with engraved labels that had been there for 150 years, um, was to learn how to lift an antique vase so that you didn't break it. And not, obviously, you'd never lift any of these ancient artifacts by the handles, which had weak points where they were glued together. You had to lift it from the base, and you had this whole object choreographic kind of movement demonstration of how to do it and how to put it on the foam tray and how to wheel the trolley and then how to move it to the vitrine and how to place it and how that would then be mounted and put behind glass. And I think the imprint of this choreography, this weird heterotopic ritual around the art object, which was, of course, in the tradition of the Enlightenment Museum, removing objects from other ritual cultures, and then placing them into this apparently non-ritual, non-magic, non-spiritual, um, educational and um, didactic space of all world cultures in one place. But really instituting this whole other choreography and, and form of behavior that was placing an emphasis on stasis and preservation. And really, um, when you think about this model, the, the kind of rationalist principles of classification, as Tony Bennett has described it in his book about museology, and the obliteration from any sense of belief or magic, and transforming all those artworks that had their own social functions into one space, a disciplinary space, and a space of observation and surveillance, which in Foucault's understanding, you know, is on par with the prison, the school, and the hospital as spaces that subdue subjects and bodies into a certain order and a certain pr principle and rationality. This is still somehow the imprint of the museum that I carry to. And I think, you know, this is how museums are organized. So fast forward about a decade, and I um, got a job after writing about Yvonne Rayner, and after becoming engaged with contemporary art in London and through the practice of many younger artists working with performance in the late 1990s, early 2000s, got a job, a one-year experimental position that Tate Modern cr created, thinking we would like, we've got this space, the empty space, um, we would like to try doing some, you know, we would like to try doing different things. And the idea of Tate's at that point was, I think, more to do um, large-scale collaborations between disciplines. So there was, a, there was an impulse to question the disciplinary basis of the museum. But my own desire was really to think about what are the artists in London and that I'd seen internationally who are working in smaller spaces, how to begin to bring that more grassroots work or that contemporary practice in which paintings and sculptures were being made by artists but often shared in a social situation in new kinds of invented rituals that artists were making amongst themselves, how to bring that aspect of practice into the museum as well, because it felt like such an important part of the story, both for contemporary art and also since the 50s, and there was really no space for it. As you know, the modern art museum like Tate with its white-walled galleries elsewhere presupposes an autonomous ritual of viewing, but usually by individuals in isolation, rather than collective moments. And the way that artworks, you know, there's often in any museum collection, I think, a kind of secret history of performance that shows the relics of things that have happened. But as with the important um, exhibition that documented those kind of practices in the late 90s called Out of Actions, curated by Paul Schimmel in LA. The objects are often shown of, as relics that had a life before they came into the museum and no longer do. So they're testimony to some kinds of social interaction 
intimacy performance, but that was something that happened before they got there. And against this perspective, something that I think is very instructive is the perspective of a curator, a First Nations curator based in Canada, Wanda Nanibush, who, working with artists like Rebecca Belmore, who identify as indigenous artists, First Nations artists, has talked about the opposite, actually, and talked about the extent to which objects actually lose value by being put in, in vitrines in museums, well, especially when collected by museums like the British Museum and other colonial enterprises, how the life of them is decreasing in value by not being in use. So the new choreography and the new ritual which they're put into by the Western Museum kind of sucks away the practice for which they're intended. And she even talked about drilling holes in the vitrines to allow those objects to breathe, which I loved, <laughs> in terms of thinking of, rather than separating objects and bodies, thinking about them on a continuum. So I'm just going to mention a few artists who I think have set the groundwork for what I want to say about Tanya Bruguera's practice in her move from being a body artist, a political body artist, working with affect and intimacy and risk and pain, through to being an artist who works in very ambitious ways on a kind of next, generational inter, uh, next generation institutional critique which is more a form of institution building, and which for her, she says, is built on a foundation of putting, like, treating emotion as the first step in politics. So degrees of seduction, of uh, friendship, of sociability, of kind of capitalizing on those, you know, feelings in human interaction as a starting point to build a political vision for her art and her social practice and to make her arte utile. But I think it's important to say that in, well, certainly in the past 40 years, but especially in the past decade, for a museum like Tate, equally for MoMA or the Van Abbe Museum in Eindhoven, ground has been broken in terms of institutional practice um, in terms of what can be done by artists and what can be achieved. And that has come about through a shift um, that's happened through the vision of individual artists whose work that we as curators, I would say this for me and many colleagues internationally, artists who've made proposals to do things that are difficult and that go against this setup of the museum that is still very much geared to moving objects, handling objects, protecting objects, placing objects, every single piece of equipment, every piece of architecture, every system in the museum, absolutely 15 years ago at Tate and even five years ago was so much geared to that, that artists like Tino Segal, who came in and said, you know, my work is only made of people moving bodies um, that are scripted without anything written down on paper, and you have to learn it and teach it in the gallery, and it can't be photographed, and you can't show a video of it. So it's only by the insistence of artists like this who have worked against the grain of everything the museum thought it was set up to do, that this kind of ground of prioritizing social relations, and actually on a human level as a worker, drawing attention to the existing infrastructure of a museum, which next to the precious objects, of course, is run by the important role of museum guards, um, the visitor experience department at Tate, with whom I collaborate much more frequently than I do with art handling to make things happen, the security guards, um, the shop, all these, you know, the, the so-called peripheral spaces that are the human infrastructure of the institution have come into play and have been other people that artists have collaborated with in order to make, you know, to realize the vision of their performance works. Um, this is an image. So, so Tanya was an artist, coming in and out of Tanya's work, as I'm going to. Tanya Bruguera was an artist that I knew because we'd invited her into the program, the performance program, that since its first experimental year had gained more of a a firm footing, but always a little bit uncertain with sponsorship and things like that. Um, 
so Tanya was an artist whose work first appeared at Tate in 2008 with this piece, Tatlin's Whisper 5. And when I'm going to talk about Tanya's current project, I think it's important to say that Tanya's version of love and her version of how to make social change happen and how to create the positive side of the politics that she's endeavouring to affect often has a kind of tough love or, or a quite a critical and aggressive um, approach to destabilising the existing situation. So with this work, she said she wanted to invite um, the mounted, mounted police to come in and perform crowd control exercises inside the museum, but to no apparent end. So purely as an exercise or demonstration of power. And they perform the six crowd control exercises that they perform in a riot situation. And for her, the piece could only be shown when a riot or some such use of this power had been in living memory. What was interesting, again, about how this happened in the institution is that we had to rely on our head of security, who had an ex-police background, to go and talk to his friends at the police. She'd sort of mobilised this network of relationships in order to make it happen. On the one hand, thinking, well, Tate's a state institution, so we're therefore it will be easy, which it wasn't particularly. On the other hand, telling us afterwards that she had wanted to stage our complicity with the state, and that was why, you know, that was the half the point of the piece, as well as creating this kind of image of authoritarianism inside a space of otherwise soft power. But in these situations, the other part of what she's always doing is, is leading people to see themselves as a community or a crowd but through this kind of um, adverse situation. I've just got a few... I can't actually see the time, so I don't know how long I'm... Um, I've got an image here, a couple of images here of other collection works that we're showing at the moment, just, just well, by Rose Finn Kelsey, a British artist. Just to emphasise the point, I think, that in collecting... In the work we've been doing, showing is one thing, and it's mobilised these different ways of working with the infrastructure of the museum, different relationships, different values, social over material. Um, at the same time, we've been specifically collecting artists who dramatise a relationship between the material and the social critically. And these are a few works that are on display now or about to be on display. Rose van Kelsey's piece, Bureau de Change, which is a monetary version of the um, Van Gogh sunflowers, which in the 1980s, when she made the piece, had just sold for a record amount at auction. And she, as with Tino, some 30 years later, had staged the performance being the guard, guarding this, in a, in a vintage uniform, guarding this kind of monetized version. I'm just going to skip the other works a little bit. But... Um, Kemang Wala Luhere, whose work will be shown in the tanks in uh, June, no, May. Um, Charlotte Posenenska, both examples of artists who make objects that are there to be activated in performative ways. And another pro project that broke substantial ground in the institution in terms of the permission that we kind of gained to experiment with the apparatus of the institution, in a way that Tanya's work certainly has done, was this project by Boris Sharmatz, 2015, which proposed a whole, a radical shift of value for the institution in asking the question if, you know, what if Tate Modern became temporarily the Musée de la Danse? And Tanya challenged me at a discussion that we had in a symposium in New York one time a few years ago, saying, you know, bringing theatre and dance into the museum is too easy. It's not agitational enough. It's not political enough. It's about form. And I think what I was hoping to show in these images is the way that, you see here, works embedded throughout the galleries by the Musée de la Dance and a giant workshop in the Turbine Hall, but that 
bringing in, I think, bringing in practitioners who are experts in working with dance and theatre into dialogue with visual artists who less often are or less often have that basis has brought in not only an attention to the human choreography of the institution in the way that Tino Segal's work or Rose Van Kelsey's work did, but also a lot of nuance in terms of questions of how to work collaboratively and how to work as a community and how to work with the body and what, what the human body needs in an institutional space to be cared for. Because I think not just the museum model being set up, uh, as I've said, around this hierarchy of the object being the ultimate locus of value, in which case water's not allowed, you know, resting points aren't allowed, all kinds of things that are messy and human are not usually allowed in museums. So the bringing in of dance has kind of challenged that hierarchy on one level. Um, but it's also, it's, I think there's been a degree to which a project like this, as with Tino's work, starts to think about the, the entire infrastructure of the museum as a performative set of behaviours which can be challenged and changed and shifted, even if you're raising the spectre of that in the collective imagination temporarily there becomes a sense for somewhere like Tate, a big institution which is often slow to, to change procedures, it raises in the imagination the idea that this could be what we value. A gesture could be something that is precious, even if it's taught to one person at a time and they take it away, that could be something as valuable as a precious artwork. Ah, Isabel Lewis as well, who thought, in a very interesting way, I've just mentioned it because she thought specifically in the piece that she did in the tanks about how sh she thought about love in a specific way in terms of how she could host visitors. So again, thinking about, not about a kind of neutral gallery viewing situation where people wander around autonomously, but that when people arrived, she would welcome them and host them and talk about love um, and create this sensuous environment coming from her own perspective in dance where she used perfume and food, um, singing, dancing, did, did workshops and really proposed this kind of sensorium in which love was a, a driver but very much following in the challenge to what appears in the gallery that have been in initiated I think by these other artists I've mentioned. So to come on to Tanya's project, I wanted to talk about it really in terms of, like I said, her, her own transition in her work and what that high period of body art that Tanya's work grew out of, that, what Leah Vergin, um, in her book, book on performance and body art in the 1970s said, that kind of ground zero of practice located in the body in which anybody in pain believes they have the right to be taken seriously. It's kind of baseline of experience. And this is just an image of um, Tanya's, one of her very earliest works in Havana called Burden of Guilt, in which she's wearing a lamb carcass and uh, with reference to um, a protest by the indigenous people of Cuba when colonizers arrived at first, hundreds of years ago, she's eating soil from the land so she's continued from this point to make works. Well, early on, she made more work that put herself in some kind of situation of pain, endurance, or risk, building on the kind of language that Marina Abramovich and others had initiated. Through, through to this work, where, as with the new Turbine Hall Commission, she started to... Um, transfer that experience of disorientation and, uh, and discomfort and vulnerability onto the bodies of visitors who enter her installations. And I think she's kind of taken those principles of body art and of self-experimentation and risk and tried to think about how she can... the basis of effecting change by creating powerful experiential images based in the same kind of feelings that she evoked in the earliest actions that she made on herself. 
So this was a work that was transitional in that sense. I think Tanya's perhaps more known for starting a political party and starting a, a school in Havana um, and, and making kind of aspects of, um, like I said, institution building that are about affecting real social change in the spirit of Suzanne Lacey. But what I've noticed with her work, the three pieces that she's done at Tate building up to this one, is that she's always breaking down in order to, to build up the positive side of the social practice. And she's talked a lot in building on her work with immigration and the status of the immigrant and the campaigning that she's done that's been supportive of... Um, immigrant rights, talked a lot about trying to, when she gets a commission in an, in an art museum, how she can affect feelings of um, vulnerability and precarity in the viewers as well, so that there's a kind of shared sense of, I guess, not to be so literal as what people in a precarious Immigrant, immigration situation might feel like, but she wants to destabilize the situation. And this was a piece she did in 2012 at Tate when we were just opening the tank spaces at first, where she, um, she took questions from the UK immigration questionnaire that's given the, the standard one. And she asked, for, she asked us to find somebody who used to do use lie detector in an army context, so this was a real guy who used to do it, interrogation. And in order to enter the installation that she'd made in the tanks, um, people had to queue and they had to answer questions. And this is something Tanya herself had, had struggled with the UK immigration and getting visas anyway. But in order to see her piece, you had to answer these questions strapped to the lie detector. And she always, in her work, she doesn't want an actor playing that part. And there's a sort of displaced authenticity in how she's transferred that body art risk onto the bodies of others and onto pieces like this or working with the police horses where she's bringing in other authentic actors and in a way that's related to how Claire Bishop's talked about um, outsourcing authenticity for groups of participants. She... Yeah, she, she put every visitor who wants to see her work through this interrogation. Immediately makes you feel guilty. I felt very guilty uh, straight away. <laughs> um, and then she got our security guards as well to collaborate with her without telling me, who's the curator of the piece, uh, to fast track some people on a purely random basis. So you'd see some people getting VIP treatment and being taken in first which the security guards very much enjoyed doing, the exercise of power, which again reflects back critically in all kinds of ways. So these are the ways she's always played it. So for her piece that's on now, um, Tan what Tanya wanted to do was to think about the, the large-scale question that she's been working on for years, the question of immigration, the global migration crisis, but how to think about that in a delimited public space, a gallery, in a specific location, in the middle of a city like London. What does it mean? And the title of her piece is a statistic taken from the International Office of Migration, which is the number of people who've migrated in the last year added to the number of people who died since January 2013. And it's a changing title. It changes every day and it's cross-referred to the website from IOM. She wanted to put that question that she'd been working on in New York with her immigrant party um, and the workshops she'd been running there, put it into dialogue with this specific question of appearing in a museum, like I say, and what could happen there, what might happen there, what should happen there, and what, what value is embedded in a space like Tate Modern, especially in the kind of premium visibility and premium... Uh, ground floor space of the turbine hall. She's very well aware of the cultural capital that that affords and what could she do with it. At the same time, what, what could she do that would genuinely connect with people and affect people? And how could she begin with 
what she talks about, the emotional basis of politics in a space like that where people aren't just walking around in the um, inside the white cube ritualized way. They're actually much more open. And now that people have got used to the space, much more informal and open to play or lie down or have a picnic. So how could she intervene in that space in a meaningful way that could nevertheless connect with these bigger political concerns? And the way that she decided to approach it was through, there were four aspects to the piece. The first one that she initially thought about uh, being present through the whole space, but the first thing she talked about actually was creating forced empathy in the space. And this is an image of Tanya crying fake tears produced by a menthol substance that she had created um, working with the perfume artist Sissel that would affect tears in visitors involuntarily. That was the idea. Most people did cry, not everybody. Um, and she, she wanted to do this because she felt to work in public space now, especially against the backdrop of online relationships, online networks, and particularly, she felt from a political point of view, online virtue signaling about political um, arguments and ideas. What could you do that would affect real-time relationships in the space? So she wanted this provoking of forced empathy, partly as a kind of strange, fake, visual equivalent of the liking the political posts on Facebook, but at the same time, she always has this very double-edged take on things. At the same time, she liked the way that once you cry, it kind of provokes, it reminds you, even if you know it's fake, the process of the tears coming produces the emotion that you'd usually associate with it. Also, when you see someone else cry, because we kept doing this test with our colleagues before, we had <laughs> before the piece opened, we were the guinea pigs, and... Um, you see somebody else crying, it immediately provokes a feeling towards them. Well, usually, or it provokes, you know, it produces... So she was interested in how fakery or affect or, or forced affect, what you got, forced empathy could nevertheless produce some kind of like third degree authentic emotion that would be in real time. And she felt could have more, could have more legs to it than this continuous kind of ambient liking or not liking or being angry online. Um, the other aspects to the project uh, were founded in her work. As soon as she arrived at Tate and knew that she had this commission, on the one hand, she thought about what would she put in the space. On the other hand, she immediately said, if I'm going to do this, I'm not just making an object, a, a picture or a sculpture or an installation. I want to know how the project I'm doing can have a legacy at the institution and I want part of the budget to go towards that immediately. So she wanted to portion a percentage of the budget that would create a legacy, a social legacy for the next two years. And she always thought about how the image so any images she's creating of relations or social interaction or empathy or care, um, how that image, and she thinks a lot about painting actually, and I think she really is an image maker. If you look, I'm not showing the right work here necessarily, but lots of the installations have this um, chiaroscuro kind of immersive dark and light. She loves Caravaggio. So she really thinks about image making, but she wants that image to have the real social substrate of effecting change somewhere in the mechanics of the institution. And this is where I think she has gained ground in working in institutions like Tate or um, Van Abba Museum, for example, who've been heavily engaged with ways of bringing performance coming from body art, coming from the unruly, undisciplined bodies of artists that were not just producing the objects to go on plinths and, and in frames and on vitrines, how institutions have learned to respond to a work like Bruguera's and to be able to run with it. And Van Abba in Eindhoven did a very ambitious project with her. And they, they were always part of a network with us called Collecting the Performative and challenging their own practices. So Tanya um, 
also um, began to do a series of workshops with people living locally because she'd been in dialogue with Richard Sennett um, and thinking about questions of immigration as it relates to public space and contemporary urbanity. And one of the questions that she kept coming back to, partly engaged with his writing, was what does it mean? I mean, yes, Im immigration is a question, great big distances are a question, but what does it mean to be a neighbour in a locality? And the question of the neighbour or the figure of the neighbour became a very important one for Tanya. Through some workshops we started to do with people in the locality, working with our communities department, our learning department, other contacts who worked on the question of immigration in London and in SE1 around Tate. Um, one of the things that really came through quite clearly to Tanya is despite the work of outreach that the museum does in many ways, and Tate's been quite good with this, I think, there's still like a people who live within a 10 minute walk of Tate often would not come through the door or not feel it was for them. And, um, and Tanya wanted to get to know who are the people that really live right here. You know, yes, the work performs to an international audience, but who are our neighbors? And so she started, she did a call out and she started walking around and going to social clubs and other organizations locally with our existing contacts and building a group, a kind of council of neighbors to Tate that became the Tate Neighbors um, as the title of the, their group. And here they are. And it was really through a sense of trying to open up the position that she had in creating these new friendships, this new dialogue with a group of people that became kind of advisors and critics that she was very closely in conversation with, that she grew the project from there. So the other aspects of the project, um, well, aside from the crying and the sound, which was, the sound was a pervasive installation in the space of low frequency, a very unsettling low frequency sound that again, like the crying was create this kind of strange disturbance in you and she'd done it with the sound artist Steve Goodman who's written a book called Sonic Warfare. Um, those were the two the two main elements that Tanya brought in but then with the neighbours she started to think about what else what could what could be done in this space and what they had we meetings twice a week um, in the six months running up to the project. And one of the things they proposed, she thought kind of wildly, was we've seen the new building, the new Tate Modern building that opened in 2016, titled the Blavatnik Building, after the financial donor. Could we propose an alternative kind of value that's not to do with money, but that's to do with you know, somebody that's recognized in our neighborhood from a point of view of their love and care and work that they do socially and in the spirit of, of Tanya's practice. And we, um, Tanya brought the idea to me and to Francis Morris, the director, who somehow miraculously got this signed off by the trustees of Tate. And the neighbors voted for somebody called Natalie Bell, after whom the building is now renamed at the moment for one year, but I, it costs so much to change the signage for one thing, but I'm really hoping that <laughs> it's one of these ways that that doesn't go back. But um, Natalie Bell is an extraordinary person that we met through this project who does, who runs a charity called SE1 United and works with um, youth in London, youth in crisis, the stories that you see every day in the London newspapers about knife crime amongst teenagers is what she's working on. And she was voted unanimously by the neighbors as the person who would be worthy of this and that would connect something about what's valued in this public building to what people care about in the neighborhood. Natalie herself was very embarrassed and humble and there she is, but um, so that was her plaque. Uh, yeah, <laughs> it's on every. Um, oh goodness, the uh, just to say the the other thing that Tanya did with the neighbours was create a uh, manifesto that came through on the Wi-Fi when you signed in to Tate Wi-Fi. Well, one of the best things she did actually was improve the Tate Wi-Fi, which was rubbish before that. That's her real legacy. But um, when you signed into the Wi-Fi to use it, you 
clicked through and agreed to a manifesto written by the Tate neighbours saying you're in this international art museum but we're your neighbours and you know what it means to act as a neighbour and how can you carry this through to where you live and Natalie Bell had a great quote herself of a Vietnamese mother and a Geordie father who said she'd t experienced terrible racism um, and xenophobia growing up in Essex in the 1980s, 70s and 80s she she, her quote, which worked its way into the manifesto, was, I'm from here, I'm from now. And she's very much about what it means to act in the here and now um, and, and carried that spirit through to the work that Tanya tried to do. Much to say, but really, I hope it makes sense, the link I'm trying to make between Tanya's impulse in, in trying to build from a position of her own delimited experience of the body in those early works through to um, working on a museum not as though it's this um, authoritative pedagogic institution that will teach us through the expertise of curators who know more than everybody else, but really what does it mean to bring in people on a level with you to make the visitors feel somehow vulnerable or affected in physical ways through the kind of the medium of the body and to displace the authenticity that was maybe naively associated with working on the body in performance art in the kind of high period of performance in the 60s and 70s to, to translate that and channel that through a whole set of bodies, behaviours and practices that are real, that are about economics, that are about... Um, value and care and ways of doing things and ways of working with people and to really try to run that through the institution in in ways that are challenged and ways that are new and I came back at the end to um, a quote a conversation between Walter Mignolo who coined the concept of decolonial aesthetics and Wanda Nanny Bush who I uh, cited earlier with her work on First Nations art in, in Canadian museums. And I think his way of thinking about the significance of the body's presence in art resonates a lot with Tanya's journey in institution shaping and the idea of kind of de-linking from certain principles of, of um, so-called civilization and enlightenment in order to return to one's located and delimited reality, whether your neighborhood or your own your own position. Mignolo says in the conversation, what unites the human species, our bodies. It's through our bodies that reconnecting to land and earth is possible and necessary. It's imperative to de-link from the principles of a civilization that trained us to block our bodies in order to give privilege to our minds, simultaneously with land conceived and instituted as private property. So... I think that speaks in many ways to the conversation we had earlier as well about Ketty La Rocca and whether it's naive to think like that about the body or whether it's absolutely necessary in order to challenge this prioritization of material values under capitalism and to, to come back with you know, an intimacy from one's own local limited experience and start from there. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Katrin, for this uh, talk that somehow touched different dimensions uh, of what we've been speaking during the day, but also uh, uh, I was always thinking about also what is going, some discussions and also the program that it's going on here in, in Kulturges, so it's like a kind of... Mm. Um, uh, it, I think it's really helpful because I was thinking about you. Uh, perhaps most of, uh, of you already saw the, the um, information about Steve Paxton's uh, exhibition. So I was thinking while he was uh, speaking about uh, these other ways of using the, the museum spaces and the introduction of 
of gestures and of mm. movement and um, so somehow it's something mediums, that it's yeah. yes. Uh, but how does it um, shift and how does it uh, uh, transform also the way that we think curatorially and how do, do you think that do we think that it's what it is a museum museum what is what mm. it is an object to be experience, experienced also um, in the next it's that it's not yet public but in the in May we'll have also uh, Walter Mignol will speak here in 17 May uh, and this uh, brings me uh, well I want to open the discussion of course but I, I also wanted to, to share it with you that I while uh, you were uh, giving your talk, I was thinking that uh, this uh, Tanya Burgara's work, but also the reflection that you are developing uh, uh, about your own curatorial work, uh, somehow it touches uh, all this um, decolon decoloniality thought about uh, museums and about cultural institutions, mm -hmm. and how we need to to shift our axis of uh, thought and mm. uh, um, transform also categories that we are used uh, uh, and behaviors that you, we are used. Yeah. So, uh, and I think that you only this um, shift that you, you made from uh, the British Museum and the way that things are, are talked in the British Museum and uh, our performance can uh, give you uh, a different perspective in what it is to do a, mm. um, well to do a museography and somehow it touched this uh, the colonial debate that it's now going on about restitution of objects what to do yes, with, the, exactly. with the museum yeah. so this is kind of a large question but I, I don't know if you want to um, or if you can uh, um, comment on it um, it's interesting though, I'm probably caricaturing the British Museum to some extent because I was there over 18 years or 20 years ago um, and I think now museums like the British Museum try to do a lot more to sort of demonstrate objects in use but it's still under the same ideology obviously of world cultures in one place and I think contemporary art museums are not immune to the same issues, actually. I mean, we're building an extraordinary global connect collection at Tate Modern, like many other museums. Um, but it feels more and more important to me to acknowledge the limited localness and stubbornness of work that isn't fluid and, you know, yes. easy to travel in that way and that is related to a community in its locality, or could be, or could grow one there. I mean, I feel we're at a point where everything is and should be very up in the air about what goes on in a museum. And what I liked, I mean, I didn't articulate it well, but these questions about what love is feel quite fundamental to that. It's kind of like saying what's human, I think, <laughs> and what, what's art, they're all too big a question. But um, something that Tanya did in this project with the neighbours felt like a step towards disturbing the comfortable base of what the museum thinks it is and the value it thinks it's embodying. And it, oh, and it was not just its feel-goodness. You know, I think the feel-good side of all of this is maybe a bit of a red herring, actually. It's more the critical questions that it opens up when you give away your authority or your, like Tanya kind of gave away her own authority in the situation. I mean, to some extent, obviously it still has her name on the project, but Natalie Bell and the neighbors group, she genuinely opened up the situation and will continue to, and has insisted that Tate also continues to, which is, you know, much as there's willingness on a practical level, that's what I was trying, one of the things I'm trying to explain is conceptual um, agreements very, very easy in art. Actually, practically getting to do any of these things is really kind of 
work. It's where yes. the work is, as you know. Yes. <laughs> so I think these steps are on a journey that I won't even say we, because I don't know who we are, but nobody knows where it's going. It just feels like a good shaking of the foundations. Mm -hmm. So thank you. I will open the debate to this other side. So there's already one there, two there, and another. So first there, and then we can go to that Hello. side. Hello. Um, I really appreciated your observations about the disciplinary space of the museum, the, the museum as a disciplinary space, mm -hmm. and your, your sort of sensitivity to the ways in your curatorial practice and working with artists, contemporary artists, that you try to think about perhaps disrupting that disciplinarity of the, of the museum space. Thinking about dance that I've seen in, in museums, um, I'm wondering if it functions a little bit differently than the way that, that Tanya Bruguera's work functions. Because in my own experience of seeing dance in museums, it still functions as a spectacle. And those, that sense of um, the, the dancers' bodies becoming objects and the museum guard still controlling your behaviors in, rea in relationship to the dancers. There's still rules that need to be followed and it doesn't feel like a real contamination or a real infiltration of the space. And I think something that you also touched on that's really interesting about Tanya's work is the ways that she truly infiltrates the institution by cooperating, collaborating with other aspects of the museum rather than just the gallery space or the curators. She works with security guards. She works with the education departments. Yeah. She, she um, almost makes herself invisible in a way. It's the, in a way, it's like the opposite of the spectacular. She does. Yes. And I think that there's a real generosity mm. in her practice. And I'm just wondering Absolutely. if you might be able to comment a little bit on generosity, her generosity, generosity, and its relationship to the larger questions of the conference. Yeah. Well, I don't know what, which bits of dance in museums you've seen, because I've seen some really bad stuff too. And actually, when I had my job interview at Tate, I said, one thing I'm not going to do is have dancers responding to the artworks in the, you know, formally just riffing off, improvising off the works in the collection, which I had just seen done really badly. I think some projects that we've done, I would, I mean, I feel, um, like the Musée de la Danse Project or Isabel Lewis, they really have also, like Tanya, or the, albeit coming from a very different practice and craft, they have nevertheless interacted with exactly those structures too, in terms of learning and, say, in the Musée de la Danse Project, each dancer who was in that picture in a room, they did have a guard for the dancer's protection actually the like the dancers wanted somebody there because otherwise they're just there somewhat vulnerable um, but the each person was working with one member of the visitor experience team who then got to they got to know each other and that person became kind of expert in their dance and it was quite it was a really different relationship and set up in terms of what the museum attendants are normally doing in there so it was much less about, like, don't touch the Pollock and more helping to share the work and be a companion to that person. And I'm not saying it was perfect. These things are always quite tricky. Um, but that did, it did embed itself in that way. Um, generosity. Tanya's naturally very, very generous. Yeah, I mean... I'd say she's somebody like Katerina Seda, actually, uh, who, who was in um, the previous presentation. Uh, you know, you have to be amazingly good at working with people and convincing them to be on board with your sometimes crazy seeming idea. So Tanya has this natural generosity and warmth. And also she's been through such a lot in her own work as an activist, and I actually didn't get onto there, but one of the things that happened, which is spirit, in the spirit of her generosity, is that Tate often has activists coming and wanting to stage protests about, like when we had sponsorship at Tate by BP, British Petroleum, there was a group called Liberate Tate who would come and stage incredibly elaborate protests with visual props and sculptures. 
and Tate would tolerate it when the space was empty, um, but no, it wasn't that we were staging our own prote you know, protest against ourselves. But Tanya said that she wanted that space she created, and I actually, I've realised now that I didn't even explain the image on the floor, which is of a man named Youssef, who Natalie Bell had helped after he was made um, homeless as a refugee <laughs> from Syria. She chose his image as one person. I actually forgot to talk about the whole main point of the piece, which was it kind of harvested people's play and energy with this thermochromic ink, that when you touched it, it warmed the image to the extent that his intimate portrait was revealed. However, actually, there was a kind of impossibility to it. You'd never get enough people to do it. So it had this, again, like all Tanya's work, this sort of double-edged failure and an invitation to intimacy with it. Um, but she said that other people could use the space for act to activist ends. And one of the things that happened right away, uh, the first week it opened, is that uh, the niece of a Bangladeshi photographer who was in prison because of his work, Shadol uh, Alam, came and said to Tanya, can I stage this protest to get visibility for him? And Tanya said yes and helped and was there with it and helped do the press interviews and things. And I, you know, I, it, it felt real to me when the text from Amnesty International, who I follow anyway, came through saying he'd been released and I think it played a small part. I'm not saying it was the only thing, but... Tanya is very into hosting other, you know, creating a space that others can enter in solidarity. And what was beautiful, actually, and incredibly moving, is that then Tanya was detained in Cuba when she went back after opening this project. She'd been protesting a new law in Cuba, the Decree 349, which is curtailing artistic freedom. And she was put in prison, and all the Tate neighbours and all the people who'd been at the other protest came and did a vigil for Tanya and protested for her. So, again, she said, you know, the Cuban government do listen. They, they don't like that sort of anti-publicity, so it makes a difference for her. It made a difference for her and the other artists who were put in prison. It was not just her, but a group of artists um, who were imprisoned and then released. Um, yeah, talking about um, protests and the BP sponsorship, um, I basically wanted to ask you about car makers because I think it was really interesting how in your presentation you touched on the relationship between the artist and the institution and the local community and like the state and, and power. Uh, but I think there's another big protagonist in this project, which is corporate sponsorship. And in, you, in your PowerPoint, we saw the name of uh, BMW, uh, Hyundai. So I was wondering um, just if you can touch on this, like from your experience of being, of curating performances in a big institution. Yeah, well, performance has been an area that never had funding. So the first job I had, like that I said, was an experimental position, was a year-long position, also sponsored by an internet bank called Egg that then went bankrupt. Um, nothing to do with me, I swear. Uh, but it's always been... I mean, this the state... I could, I could go on, but the status of this area of practice has always been marginal. So it's always been considered additional programme, not core programme, until very recently. <coughs> always depended on some kind of additional funding. Also, the model in the UK has been a decrease in government funding or any kind of core state funding year on year. It's now down to under 30%. So I don't know how Nick Sorota got Tate Modern built, but... You know, the phase two, I mean, we do know partly Mr. Blavatnik helped. It's really just, especially by the Tory government in the UK, the um, funding's been cut away and cut away. And I remember seeing David Cameron on TV ten years, nine years ago saying, I've got this idea, American-style philanthropy, which doesn't work particularly well in the UK because there isn't a culture of tax breaks. And So Tate is doing a lot of work on cultivating donors, but corporate sponsorship is kind of the middle ground um, in those cuts, and all I can say is Hyundai 
are the most extraordinary understanding. I mean, in terms of knowing the art that they're sponsoring, I was quite blown away. Neither BMW or Hyundai have ever um, said that we can't do anything we want to do, which counts for something, I must say. Like, we've explained what Tanya was going to do, who she is. She's been in prison in Cuba. No questions have been asked, so... The, yeah, they ha their name is on the programme, but... I think... I don't know who was first. Maybe I'll pass first to Liz. And then for you. Thank you very much. It was very touching, your presentation. And I was, um, you know, throughout the narrative, I definitely was um, um, very touched by the time uh, Natalie Bell got her name on the building. <laughs> she just got fantastic. something like, really, like, it was very... Um, a story of achievement, very important to share with us as well. Um, I was interested to uh, it was it was interesting you you showed Musidla dance because before that <laughs> I just had thought about um, um, how do you see the relationship between museum archival practices, preservation, performance, the ephemeral performance, performance coming into museum, and thus. Um, eventually uh, dealing now with um, issues of possibilities of preservation and um, eventually if preservation of performance may have to do with reproduction and how does mm. that resonate with the politics of uh, performance that are against reproduction yeah. and performing arts performing art, performance art being particularly autobiographical so that frame um, because of performance coming into the museum and that issue arising in that mm. context? Well, it's a really good question. A key question for the area, I think, because I think what happened was artists like Tino Segal, Roman Ondak, Tanya, Elmgreen and Dragset kind of pulled the rug from under everybody, everyone's ideas about performance and whether it could be in a museum in a live way um, by saying the work could be additioned and sold and playing that game with the market and saying, you know, an object. I mean, much as I've emphasised the distinction between material objects and social objects, Tino was quite explicit that his favourite artist was Jeff Koons uh, at that early point in the 2000s, and that, you know, he was interested in the experience economy and that performance could be a commodity as well. And um, Marina Abramovich has obviously to kind of reinvented to some extent her relationship to the authenticity of the actions f from the 70s but she would never lots of artists have from that generation I think led by the younger generation a lot of artists from the previous generation have reconsidered whether they would reenact their work from that period and maybe the Steve Paxton conversation is interesting there because Yvonne Rayner certainly did reconsider that Joan Jonas has reconsidered it with us quite recently and done it. I mean, I think there's a distinction in the practice between the kind of work like Rhythm O by Marina Abramovich, which she said, I would never and I could never recreate that work because obviously it ended with somebody holding a live gun to her head and a situation of extreme risk. She would not put herself in for a reenactment. Other works as well, I mean, you know, there are... There's a Chinese artist I did a, um, a studio visit, Hei Yun Chang, who'd made a very, very difficult, painful piece of body art and in a context of hardcore political body art emerging in China in the 1990s of being cut right down his body with a razor blade. I mean, I think there are works that are not reenactable. And for those works, working with the artists, I have thought about the importance of nevertheless representing them through the documentation that the artists have overseen. Uh, you know, artists often make the work like Herman Nitsch and the actionists did, um, often are making documents that become the work in their mind. So I think that's really important to have within the story of art in a museum. But there are the artists who say, no, it's a score and it can be, you know, it can be reenacted 
often artists now obviously making work for the context of the gallery of the museum in a different way as well making scripts and scores that are repeatable more like music so I have to say I've written a 28 page strategy about collecting performance for Tate and uh I'm differentiating in there all those kinds of ways that performance can appear. And sometimes it's in an object like the Charlotte Posenenska sculpture that I skipped through, which is intended to be activated. Sometimes it's a photo, sometimes it's a score. Um, but it, it pops up. I think everything it almost has a performance, a performative dimension somehow or speaks to that question. But for live work, some can and some can't, I would say. And it's usually working with the artist or the estate to establish that. Just very quickly, is Tate buying some of some work in that sense? I mean, is it able yeah. to buy? Yes, we and get property on <laughs> hmm? Do you get, get property on social work? Well, Tate's, I mean, we've got about 18 or 19 works that are live in some way in the collection now. Um, lots of other works that you could say represent performance. Buying actual social practice is a difficult... We, You know, a major acquisition for us, actually, and even it sounds easy, but it was difficult ten years ago, was buying Suzanne Lacey's piece, The Crystal Quilt, which was considered to be an archive, not an artwork, because it documented this big women's action she did with 400 women on uh, Mother's Day in 1984. And there was a big debate at the point of acquisition as to whether it was the artwork or whether it was simply an archive. And I think a lot of ground's been broken in that conversation in the last 10 years. And artists who were previously seen as just the photographer, like Charles Atlas or even Babette Mangold as the video, video maker, are recognised as artists in their own right who were making images of that important work. Okay, I have two, two ideas um, about uh, your talk. The first is about, I think in the 60s and 70s, the performance artists are kind of, were kind of uh, obsessed, not with the body, because the body is a kind of a image, a cu cultural construct, but with the, f the flesh. Mm. I think flesh is it's a, a, a good, a, it's yeah. other thing. I'm I'm recalling uh, Vito uh, Conchi biting uh, mm. himself or Gina pa Pan, Pan cutting herself. Yeah. Um, this is an idea that the the second idea is okay. I think uh, Tania Bruguera, uh, who the project about uh, the neighbors is amazing. I think it's about uh, giving power. It's it's about empowering people that once was uh, very fragile, very mm. vulnerable, because they, in the, in the next door, they, they uh, have a great building, a grand institution, yeah. but don't, they don't feel that, that they were good enough to enter into the museum. Mm. It's, it's, it's amazing uh, idea. Or not feeling welcome, yeah. Yes. Which was a, very yes. interesting in relation to Isabel Lewis's yes. work as well, but, I think, but my, host. My, my issue is, okay, um, I think it's, it could be a, 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 a little bit uh, about um, reality shows. The, the reality shows um, give us that naive idea that we see life. The, the, it's it's the, yeah. have to do with the concept of authenticity. But once you put someone uh, with a camera, it's a, a spectacle. Mm. It's it's a show. It's a, it's a show. It's not life. Once you put uh -huh. the, the lives of the, that neighbors in the frame of the museum, <coughs> I think it's not authentic uh, anymore. What? It's well, a provocative a, question. A very, very good question, I think. And it's exactly the question we debated with Tanya. Because, to be honest, when we invited Tanya, I think a lot of people in Tate who like the idea of social practice as a commission were thinking, great, we will have a circle of people authentically talking in the turbine hall and, you know, there'll be this visible social practice. Tanya's always so much more barbed than that. Because what she did, I think, is like harvest...
the social energy of the visitors, who she's a bit, not critical of, but, <laughs> you know, this thing of, I mean, I had the image on there of the school kids, which was lovely and innocent on one level, but she's, to make the actual installation work, to warm up the floor, you needed loads of people just being on it, rolling on it, playing on it, touching it. So I feel like in a Facebook data, Cambridge Analytica kind of way, Tanya did this lo-fi metaphor for sucking people's energy into making her work appear. The actual neighbours did not appear at all to the public. So actually those workshops she did were always behind closed doors. They were the power locus actually because they said let's name it natalie bell we're going to have a group that meets for the next two years we want to choose yousef as the image on the floor um, but they were not there for like public viewing and it's interesting how that moves on from suzanne lacy's work where she's often made it which i think was really important and she's a major influence for tanya as a feminist from the 80s and obviously a friend of barbara t smith um she wanted to make conversations mainly between women or marginalised groups visible in the gallery or in public space in a, in a more literal way and that you could kind of eavesdrop into them. And when she did a, an equivalent of the crystal quilt called Silver Action in the tanks, that's what she did. She had real people come and talk to each other and visitors could listen in. But Tanya is, in a way, next generation. She, she didn't want to make that what you see and she understands the failures of relational aesthetics, I think, in that sense. But we have time for our last question. So I think, Julia. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Catherine. It was very, very interesting. Um, I have a personal question. Say, you know lots. Of, you know all about it. <laughs> no, <laughs> because, it because you, you started with, with your... Um, experiences as an assistant curator in the British Museum and the way it shaped uh, mm. your kind of uh, experience as a curator, the way you think about objects, etc. And I'm very curious about how actually this kind of practice infiltrates the museum, not only as something that is hosted in the museum or that kind of uh, shapes the understanding of a work of art for the public, but also how it may infiltrate the own museum structure, the hierarchies of the museum, and yeah. how people work together in the museum. So um, I wanted to ask you on a more personal note, mm. how working with these artists, especially with Tanya in this case, actually uh, eventually stemmed a reflection in you about uh, curatorial authority and the way you work as a curator and mm. what is curatorial authority for you and at Tate in general and how curators work together, etc. Yeah, I mean, there's a, I hope the answer isn't too boring, but, you know, when I started trying to do this work at Tate, like I said, it was an absolute uphill battle. We were not allowed to use the art handling lift or workshop or, like, everything was not for this part of the program because this wasn't what the museum was supposed to be doing. I mean, and that wasn't the director, that was just the culture. Yes. So we've come a really long way in, uh, you know, the museum database, for example, has a category of performance, which means we can actually acquire it and accession it and put it on the database, which we didn't have before. We have a production manager who has expertise in producing more theatre-like things instead of just the art handling department. We have some equipment and we have some spaces and, you know, we have a culture that has grown to accept or even plan <laughs> that this could be part of what the museum does. And even in the last year, we've set up a fund because what had happened to artists like Tino Segal and Roman Ondak, um, which they can tell you themselves, is that uh, museums like Tate and others were buying these live works and then when it came to displays, collection displays, there's very little budget in museums for displays. So it's all about, you know, you've got your storage, you've got your conservators and you've got your art handlers and everything in theory can come out and go on display without much money. There's no transport, no insurance. For performance, obviously, it costs not very much to acquire it, but it costs quite a lot to put it on. So the performance works in museums are never being shown. 
because there's no budget to display them. So they were only happening through the sponsored program. Or, you know, when we opened the Blavatnik building in 2016, I used the BMW budget to show our collection works in performance because they were never getting shown. So in the last year, we set up a, a new fund, partly funded through the members and, and through other donors, um, to pay for performance works to be displayed. <laughs> so there are many small steps, which means that now our head of displays will think, OK, naturally, I'm going to show three of the live collection works this year. And naturally, now we, we've bracketed, I called the live exhibition the live exhibition because everyone in the institution understands what an exhibition is. Whereas if you say it's a festival or a performance event, then that's not very important. So somehow, these practices now have a kind of natural or regular footing in the infrastructure. There are new positions new works in the collection, which is the museum's narrative. I think in terms of the bigger questions about authority, I think we... I, I don't know. I'm taking a six-month break myself. Uh, <laughs> I mean, not a break, but just a, a kind of a sabbatical, because I think I, you know, I've just hired a fantastic new curator who um, comes from Australia and has a whole other perspective than me, and I think we should always be asking those questions, you know, about ourselves and and what the museum's doing. So that's a work in progress. But seeing through the eyes of artists is what I try to learn from, I guess. And Tanya's has effected these changes which will stay on after the project and we've you know, and fighting to get that to happen for her is something I feel I can do to to help that. Hmm. So, uh, thank you very much, Catherine, and uh, thank you to you all. Thank you. Uh, the great questions. Yeah. This, is, this is about the most non-intimate conversation you can have, isn't it? <laughs> Sitting up alone up here. Well, not alone, sorry. No. <laughs> yeah. But a good conversation nevertheless. Thank you. Yes, thank you. And uh, we'll stop today, but uh, we'll start tomorrow at 10.30 with... Uh, uh, conferência performativa, performative talk uh, with Susana Mendes Silva. Uh, so please uh, come back and be on time. Uh, we'll have uh, another set of debates uh, ending at this same hour tomorrow. So thank you for uh, your presence and hope to see you tomorrow. Obrigado. Thank you. <laughs>